Hi everybody, um, I'm Paul. I'm going to be uh, talking to you today um, about a semi-new language. It's a few years old, but it just hit uh, 1.0 uh, earlier this, well, in 2014, late 2014. It's called uh, Elixir. And it's a language that solves a lot of problems that we have as Rubyists and has a very neat toolkit and I think you will find uh, pretty interesting. So um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I work at a company called BitPay Inc. We do uh, Bitcoin transactions and I work in the integrations department. And the thing that I do is I build the integration software over and over and over and over again in different languages. So I've built it in Ruby, Python, Python 2, Go, C, Perl, Android, uh, and Elixir. Um, and you know, I've, I've blogged a little bit about, about how these different languages work out. Um, you know, why you know why Go is hard but good. You know, why C is you know a, a miserable pit of despair, um, but good. Uh, and um, <clears throat> Elixir has so far of the languages that I've worked in. It's just been the one that I found kind of the most fun. The, the way that I built things in Elixir had the biggest effect on how I wrote everything that I wrote after that. And all of the libraries that I built after I built, this, built the library in Elixir were very much informed by the patterns that I used in that language. And that's something that's, to me, pretty good, is that it, you know, a language that just makes you kind of change the way you think or shifts your brain a little bit is, is a good language indeed. Um, but what, it, what is Elixir and, uh, and why would be a good question. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit of the history. We're going to do a brief introduction. I'm going to do a little bit of a code example, uh, comparing some Ruby code uh, to some Elixir code. We're going to solve the same problem in both uh, languages. It's a simple problem. Um, uh, we're going to look at uh, the, the tool that will probably be closest to the Rails, uh, Railsists, Rails programmers among you, which is the Phoenix Web Framework. Um, and then I'm going to have like a, a pitch on why you should all pick up this language and run with it. Um, or yet another pitch on how to, yeah. All right. So let's start out. So what is Elixir? Um, so to understand Elixir, you have to understand Erlang. Or not to understand the language, but to know what Elixir is, you have to know what Erlang is. So what is Erlang? Erlang is a language that was developed by Ericsson um, back in the 90s. Um, so, and... It uh, was originally built to handle a problem that Ericsson had, which was they needed to do many, many thousands of connections per switch. They needed to have a system that would never, ever fail. Um, and they needed to be able to easily do distributed programming. Those are the problems that they had. And the solution to those problems that they built was this Ericsson virtual machine um, and a set of tools to go along with it. Um, and along with that, they developed this language, Erlang, which was very much informed by Prolog um, in terms of its syntax and is pretty much a functional language with some funky stuff attached to it. The thing that it gives you is that it is amazingly concurrent. It's built for it. That's the thing that it does. Erlang processes are very lightweight, so you can run you know, tens of thousands of processes on your laptop with no problem uh, running simultaneously. Um, and the way that it's structured is extraordinarily fault tolerant. So, you know, things crash and you just restart them and everything continues going very nicely. Um, and a lot of this is made possible by this uh, strange technology called, open, uh, called OTP, uh, which stands for the Open Telecom Platform because it was built by a telecom. Um, but it's actually just a generic server environment, um, you know, built from servers and supervi you know, supervisors and workers. And some of the workers are also supervisors that are supervising other workers that are supervising other workers. And it builds this huge supervision tree that is able to communicate in and between itself. Um, and, and that provides this protocol for inter-server pr um, communication so that if an Erlang program wants to talk to a process, from the point of view of each process, it really doesn't matter where that other process is. Is it on the same machine? Is it on a different machine? Is it on an embedded switch somewhere? Nobody cares, right? All you need is the ID and you can send in a message and you get a message back. So it's all based on messages and mailboxes. Um, 
And it also comes with a fairly nice in-memory distributed database server uh, called Amnesia um, and some nice debugging tools and various other fun things. They're just part of this package. Um, and the existence of that um, has enabled a lot of companies to build very interesting things. So who are the people who use Erlang? Um, the company that's probably like the, the hottest hotness that has used Erlang recently is WhatsApp. Um, so at, at one point, WhatsApp um, on their servers were holding like 2 million simultaneous uh, TCP connections uh, per server, um, which is not bad. I mean, that's reasonable capacity. They're doing okay. Um, they had you know, 32 engineers. They were serving 450 million users. Um, they were a chat app that got bought by Facebook, which already had a chat app. And what Facebook was buying, um, a lot of people who are looking at the industry think what Facebook was buying was, A, all those Erlang programmers. They wanted those 32 engineers because initially Facebook built their chat functionality in Erlang, but they had to abandon it because they couldn't find people to, to work in it. So one thing they were buying were the engineers and also the, this you know, system that was already built. Um, but you, know, you go back in time and you know, uh, something that many of us have probably used at work um, you know, for message queuing, uh, RabbitMQ, which is um, one of the you know, basic queuing systems that you might connect to with your Rails application at, any given, at some time. That's built on Erlang. Um, you've probably heard of the React database. Uh, which Basho built, which is this you know, highly concurrent distributed database system that you know, supposedly is you know, great for big data and all those things, also built in Erlang. And Apache built CouchDB in Erlang, so, um, which is another distributed, fault-tolerant, you know, high-capacity, big data type of database. So you can solve these big problems um, in Erlang. Um, but of course, you know, not, not all of our problems are, are big problems. Uh, so you might ask yourself, well, if Erlang is so cool, why doesn't everybody use Erlang? And the answer is because Erlang is hard. Um, for most of us coming out of this sort of C, Java, Python, Ruby world of languages where we expect dots and we expect you know, function calls to look a certain way and arguments to be presented a certain way and we kind of don't, you know, we expect capital letters to mean certain things and colons to mean certain things. Erlang is confusing as heck because none of these things are there, right? You have to put a period at the end of every statement. I mean, what's, that's just weird, right? It's, it's no weirder than having to put a semicolon, but we're used to one and we're not used to the other. So that's one, wonky syntax. Um, two is it's hard to get your mind around, you know, concurrent programming is actually very difficult uh, mentally. Um, and the community, the Erlang community, is not exactly mean. They're just like really silent. Um, <laughs> so, they're not terribly helpful. Uh, so why should you use it? Well, you shouldn't. You shouldn't bother. You should just go ahead and skip the Erlang and go right to using Elixir. Um, so what is Elixir? Elixir is a language that also runs on the Erlang virtual machine. It has all of these things that Erlang has, um, but it's a little bit nicer to you. Um, so some, some context around this. Um, I'll go ahead and read the quote. Uh, this is a highly redacted quote. Okay? This is like four paragraphs cooked down to these you know, what, two sentences. Um, Says, I'm on the Rails core team. This is Jose Valim, the guy who, who created Elixir. He's working on making Rails thread safe. It was very frustrating work. I ended up stopping, he said. I'm saying if concurrency is becoming more and more important, he needs to find a good solution. And then that leads him to Erlang, the second part. And my favorite part of this is, uh, to me, that was quite amazing because it was like solving the long term, solving the big problem. And, and here he's talking about distributed applications, right? Which is the elephant in the room. They took the elephant out of the room because concurrent programming is just a subset of distributed programming. So once you solve distribution, you've solved concurrency. Um, and so he found that this was there with the Erlang virtual machine and decided to build a language that made sense. And so one thing that is interesting about this is that this is somebody who's working on the Rails core team. He's trying to get Rails to be thread safe. 
he's finding it to be more or less impossible because you can't guarantee safety among a variety of different conditions, right? He's looking for another solution. He's going to build a whole language. But from the Ruby community's point of view, right, this is probably a good thing because if anybody's going to build a language that we can read, right, odds are it's going to be somebody who's already building stuff in the language that we all use every day in the framework that's most familiar. Um, so it's a, it's a Erlang uh, virtual machine language. It's fully interoperable with Erlang. You can call your Erlang libraries from inside Elixir. Um, it's functional, mostly. There are no objects um, in Elixir of any kind. Um, it's extensible. It has a, a really nice metaprogramming system. Um, just truly breathtaking. Um, and it's supported by an awesome community. And what I mean by supported by an awesome community is that um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about the Phoenix web framework. Uh, if you go onto um, the IRC channel for Elixir Lang and you ask a question about Phoenix, the guy who built it is the guy who answers your question. Okay, it's like DHH is just hanging out on the channel all day going, oh, you got a Rails question? I got a Rails answer. <laughs> That's cool. Incredibly supportive people. Um, Travis CI just, um, just upgraded to support for Elixir. So before this, you had to go through some hoops uh, with your .travis YAML file in order to get it to run an Elixir program. You had to install Erlang, you had to do some before scripts, there was a bunch of stuff. Some guy, when Travis upgraded to supporting Elixir, went through, as far as I can tell, every single GitHub repo that has a, that uses Elixir and builds on Travis and issued a pull request to fix all of our Travis files. That is a helpful community. Okay. <laughs> um, now, Elixir is built on the Erlang virtual machine, but it is not syntactic sugar on top of Erlang, okay? It's definitely its own language. It has um, its own structures, it has its own syntax, it has powers that Erlang doesn't have, right? So you can't really metaprogram easily in Erlang, but you can in Elixir. Erlang uh, distribution system doesn't have specifically actors and processes, which are two different special cases of, of workers. Uh, but Elixir does. So Elixir gives you a lot more. So it's not just syntactic sugar, it's its own language. Um, so it is not just CoffeeScript, essentially, to the, to the JavaScript. It's really its own powerful thing. As I mentioned, it's not object-oriented, uh, which might make you think that it's hard to learn, but you'd be wrong, because it's not hard to learn. You know that's true, because I put it on a slide. Um, okay, so um, let's take a brief introduction to Elixir. Let's look at some code. This is the problem that we're going to be solving. Uh, it's the, the classic Roman numerals kata. Um, if any of you are familiar with Roman numerals, it's the numbering system used by the ancient Romans, which uses these letters to stand for those numbers. And then you have to kind of compose um, you know, combinations of these letters in order, in order to represent the number. Right? So you know, in, the, in this case, you know, 3,742, Three thousands, that takes care of your thousands place. DCC, that's going to take care of my hundreds place. There's my 700. Uh, XL, it's going to take care of my tens place. That's my 40. And then twos to take care of my ones units, right? So each unit is just going to be parsed into one of these um, sets of numbers. So that's our problem, more or less. And, and let's, let's solve that in Elixir and in Ruby um, and see how that goes. All right, so uh, this is state zero. I haven't done anything. Uh, this should actually be uh, blank because there's no lib and no test folder down here in the Ruby section. Um, but up there in the Elixir section, all I've done at this point is typed one terminal command. I've said, you know, mix, uh, mix new, and I gave it a name, Roman. Okay, and then mix very kindly, Let's see, where am I? There I am. Came up here and went ahead and built a test for me. Right? Built me a nice little test helper. Uh, built me a nice little mixy XS file. So what is mix? Mix is kind of like rake plus bundler. 
right? It's going to handle all your tasks. It's going to handle all your dependencies. Um, so they went ahead and built me a nice uh, mix file, which has a logger application already attached to it. I don't think I have any dependencies. Um, you know, a nice little kind of like a little gem package here, um, which is going to make it really easy to use a package manager later on because it's already kind of built there. So it's already built me all these nice structures, which is very nice. And let's go ahead and see. Yay, our test passes. So that's fantastic, right? All right. Um, so that's the first bit, but it's not terribly useful. You know, if we look at our file, you know, that it built for us, of course, there's no code in it. So probably we should build some tests and some code in both languages. So let's do that. Um, uh, all right. Yeah, I love my file. Okay, so here we have the same code. Um, you know, we're going to do this in Ruby. We're going to do this in Elixir. Uh, so far, things look pretty, pretty much the same, right? So instead of develop, uh, creating a class, I'm going to create a module. The module is called Roman. Class is called Roman. It's got a method that you can call on the module or the class called parse. It takes one argument, and it returns i, right? Because that's the way that we're going to convert the Arabic numeral one into the Roman numeral I, right? Um, and you know, I, I, I promise you at this point, my test passes um, in, in both languages. Um, actually, we, because that, that's the test, so <laughs> it passes. Um, what does the test look like now in Elixir? Looks pretty much the same, right? This is, this is uh, X unit. Um, and uh, X unit mini test, we can see these are these are fairly similar. Um, you're not going to have a lot of trouble reading one or reading the other, right? So we're very happy about that. We have our first test uh, It passes, and how do we know that it passes? That's how. Yay! Okay. We have one broken test at this point, right. and that's just wanted to run that just to like kind of you know get an idea of like what the output of the test looks like. You know, pretty simple. Um, if we go down to uh, let's run the movie. right? Looks awfully familiar. Right. So you're, you're getting the same kinds of stuff that you would be used to in a Ruby working environment. You know, you're getting good test output, you're getting good test frameworks to work with. So, so far the syntax has been um, pretty much the same. Um, it's going to get a little different at this point. So I'm going to fix that test and as I do, um, let's, let's actually, let's take a moment to look at the, uh, yeah. you get to my broken test, I've, there we go, there we go, all right. So this is the first kind of new thing that you might see in Elixir, um, up there on the top. Uh, we're using something called a guard clause. Um, so I'm saying, oh yeah, um, parse my number. If it happens to equal one, do you know return one. If it happens to equal two, return two. If it happens to equal three, return two, which is why my test is failing. Um, so I can redefine this method with one argument, two arguments, three arguments. Um, I can redefine it with different guard clauses attached to it. And each one of those things is going to return me different values or cause different things to happen. Um, which is a slightly different pattern than the pattern that I'm currently following in the, in the Ruby code, right? Where I'm just kind of, it's still a conditional, but it's a, it's a different way of looking at the conditional. 
Um, all right, so let's. Uh, okay, and then it gets a little different, I think, at this point. Yeah, S two. All right. And also, it wasn't terribly necessary because I don't have to run guard clauses. I can just call specific quantities. I can say, hey, if the parse function gets one, two, three, I could put anything in there or nothing. Right? And it would respond differently depending on what exactly the argument is that I send into my method, which is reasonably cool. And I like this pattern. Um, This guy's apparently still broken. No. Okay. So I'm kind of starting to build a solution now, right? So we wanted to, um, I've decided I'm just going to go down the road where I take every individual possible return statement and I'm just going to return the literal, you know, every possible input and I'm just going to return every possible output. What the heck? There's only 3,999 possible inputs. How hard can it be? This is the road we're going to go down here in, in our testing, right? Um, so let's move to step three here. And that's what I do there, right? So we're just going to, we're going to take that all the way up to nine. Um, This looks a little bit more awkward in Ruby, but it's basically the same thing. That I'm, you know, it's the same basic road we're walking down, right? I decide to use a case statement here, and when it's one, do one, when it's two, do two, da 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 da. And that seems to work out for that. Um, and testing wise, that is not the file I wanted, you know. Everything still looks the same, except that I get to use one line methods in, uh, in Elixir and not in Ruby. You know, we're just asserting on each value. So, but of course, you know, things can't remain that simple forever. You know, obviously this, you know, I mean, I could keep doing this, but, you know, then I'd have to do, you know, you know I've got 23, so what am, am I not going to go through 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, so all the way up to 23. So I'm probably going to have to do something different for that. And this guy, you know, same basic tests. So in Ruby or in Elixir, I said to come up with just a slightly different way of looking at this. And then this, so this is some code that introduces some genuinely uh, new and interesting syntax and new things that Elixir gives you that are fun. So first off, you know, we're, we're just going to, you know, we have the, the basic, um, you know, we have our guard clause at the top. If it's less than 10, just, you know, parse the number. And it's going to go down and hit that parse ones function that I wrote, right? Otherwise... Um, take the head and the tail, do some stuff to it, or set it equal to, and that's not really setting it equal to it, so it's really more of a pattern match. We're going to take this idea of head and tail, and we're going to try and match it with the thing on the other side. The thing on the other side is, um, I mean, integer to string num is pretty clear, right? I think everybody pretty much knows what I'm doing there, right? Um, the thing after it, that little pipe with the, the vertical pipe and the, uh, I guess that's a greater than sign, that's a pipe operator. And what it's going to do is it's going to take the output of my last function is going to become the first input to my second function, right? So the integer to string num is going to return me a string. I want you to take that string and I want you to find its code points, which is another way of saying split, right? We can look at the Ruby code, and you guys can see it's basically the same. Um, in fact, let me bring that up real quick for translation. 
right? Here we go. So there we are on the split, right? And then I'm going to take that, I'm going to use my enum module, and I want to map. I'm going to call an anonymous function, which is what the and is. Uh, and I want to take string to integer of the first argument, right? Uh, which is, you know, essentially what I've done is the same thing I'm doing down here, right? I'm going to take my number, I'm going to split it up into strings, you know, I'm going to split it up, I'm going to turn it into a string, I'm going to split that string, and then for each item in that string, I'm going to convert it back to an integer. So it's just a way of taking a number and turning it into a string of numbers in each place. Um, before I figured out this trick, when I did the Roman numerals kata, it took me forever. I had to do all these mods and divs and all kinds of stuff. And then in a pairing interview with my friend Michelle, she was just like, oh yeah, we'll just split the string. I was like, okay, A, I hate you, and B, you're hired. <laughs> okay. So um, it, it just made this kata so much easier. Uh, so I'm going to take all that, um, and then... Since uh, I only have, um, we're only up to 23, right? So there are no numbers greater than 99 in our universe. So we're just going to parse the 10s, and I'm going to concatenate that, right? So it's kind of similar to my string concatenation down here at the bottom, which you can also do string concatenation exactly in this syntax in Elixir. So it has precisely the same syntax you already know, um, although I'm not using it here. Uh, and I'm just going to concatenate these two strings together. I'm going to take the 10s, and then I'm going to... Uh, do some funky stuff with the tail of this function, right? Which there's no real reason to do right now, but I'm doing it anyway. Where I'm going to take the tail and I'm going to uh, rejoin the tail and convert it back into an integer, right? So I took my number. I split it into an array of numbers. I took the head, which is the first one, right? I do something with it. And then I'm just going to take the tail, the, last, the last rest of the numbers of the array, crunch it back into a single number, and throw that number back to parse. OK? Uh, which is, you know, I don't know. I like it. And I'm doing it in the, uh, in the Ruby, I'm doing it exactly the same way. Um, except that I'm just, since I know that it's a two item array, I'm just going, yeah, give me the parse, the parse tens with zero, parse ones with one. And these methods uh, are still looking pretty ugly down here in Ruby. Right? I'm still using a lot of cases here, which I'm not terribly happy with. And it's essentially just the same methods there in Elixir. I'm just pattern matching on the same numbers and just returning different stuff. Um, which looks like a lot of code, but really using Vim, that was like a minute and a half of work, right? Just, oh yeah, copy those things, then do some string replacing and we're done, right? Um, okay. I'm sure you could do it in Emacs too. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, you could. I, I couldn't. I'm sure other people could do it in Emacs, but not, I'm, I'm, I don't know Emacs that well. So, uh, but let's just say, using a generic editor of sufficient power, <laughs> that's easy. OK. Um, all right. So let's move on. Let's see. So where am I at right now? So I have 4A? OK. All right. So let's move on to step five. Okay. All right. So step five, if we look at our test, um, we're just going to do the rest of this, right? So we're going to get 94, 914, and 488. So, and I'm going to do the same thing in the in the Ruby code. So how do we finally end up working on this? which is exactly the same way, right? Um, if the number's less than 10, just parse it. If the number's less than 100, give me the head, the tail, parse the tens, concatenate it uh, with the result of parsing the ones. If it's less than 1,000, parse the hundreds, 
and attach that to the result of parsing the rest of the string. Right? So it's the same pattern, and it's going to just run through one and twice, three times, and then it's going to return, and we're done. And I'm reasonably happy with that. I've done some stuff. I took that big long pipe function and you know converted it into its own little method. Um, but other than that, you know we're still using the same basic pattern, and life is good. We're using our guard clauses. We're using the pipe operator to kind of compact our code. Down in Ruby. Come on, where are you? Yeah. And and even though it's shorter to me, this just feels a little bit more awkward. I don't know why, but you know, you you, but you can pack everything into one method, right? Um. I'm, I'm doing a return on a recursive call, which I'm not sure is so. Elixir supports tail recursion, and I know it supports tail recursion, so I feel very comfortable doing recursive methods. And also, it doesn't have a while loop, so I really don't have a choice. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but it supports tail recursion, so you know who cares? You just make sure you're using tail recursion, and you should be fine. You know, uh, an infinite loop is an infinite loop, whether it's a loop or a stack of calls, right? Um, you could probably put, you could do a linter, um, that would, that would do a, you could probably, you could do a static code analysis that would look. Um, but, you know, this is, I mean, you know, it's like three calls here. The stack wouldn't go too deep no matter what, so. Uh, tail recursion just means that if, if you, um, if you have a recursive function and the recursive function is absolutely the last call that you make and only the last call that you make um, in the function, right? So the function's gonna go through some stuff and then it's gonna call itself. And as long as that call is absolutely the last thing you do and you, um, you, know, you don't do anything after that, then the compiler essentially wraps that into a while loop when it compiles it, okay? And, and it therefore doesn't actually build a, a call stack, uh, which saves you time and space and you know, keeps you from overflowing your stack, so. Um, so, um, <clears throat> anyway, so we were just going to do the same thing though, right? So, um, I'm kind of futzing my Ruby to be more like my Elixir, but one thing I like about that is that this is a much shorter method than I would have written if I had just been written Ruby. Like, if I were just writing this in Ruby, I probably wouldn't have thought of doing this right off the bat. It wouldn't have felt natural. Um, to just go, oh yeah, return this if this is true, return that if that's true, and return that if that's true. And those last two are recursive calls. This, this would not have occurred to me as like a reasonable thing to do in my standard Ruby way of solving this problem, but in the Elixir way of solving this problem, it's, it's very much the natural way to solve that problem because of the constructs that are there, the guard clauses, the reliance on recursion, um, and the pattern matching. It's a natural way to solve the problem. And... Um, just so that we know that everything works, let's run our tests. All right. Yeah, it's much longer. All right, so our test passed, so we're happy at this point. All right. And then, of course, since this code is ugly, we must refactor it. and introduce one more language structure. Uh, these look like instance variables. They are not instance variables. They're attributes of the module. They can't change. They're much more like constants. Okay. Um, and this, this, this is the point where you, know, you realize that you, know, you can construct all of this into an array, and you can just have your return value be the nth number of the array instead of saying uh, constructing a different method for one and two and three and four, you just go, give me one and then return that value out of my array. You know, which is exactly what we're gonna do, right? When we look at the parse ones and the parse twos. 
There's no particular reason to use the pipe operator here. I could just as easily say enum at one's array with num. Um, but you know, I just get kind of addicted to it and just keep using it even when it's not strictly necessary or even useful. Um, and just as, as an example, I, I put this in here. Um, and this tail to int function is just, remember we went through that whole thing where we were taking the tail and we were going to join it, and then we take the join and we convert that join to an integer. Uh, that's wrapped up into that tail to int method. So this parse tail to int tail is exactly the same call as this parse tail piped to tail to int, right? So the tail just becomes the first argument to the tail to int method, okay? So those are the same piece of code, essentially. Uh, so, you know, having thus simplified that, um, did the same thing in Ruby, right? And got rid of a lot of code and ended up with, you know, about a 20 line solution to this particular problem, which is not bad. Um, it'd be a little bit longer if we went all the way up to the thousands, like two lines, I think, two to five lines longer. So, you know, and that solves the whole problem. Um, and so that's kind of, that's kind of a, a brief look at some Elixir syntax and how it looks when it's stacked up with Ruby syntax. Um, you've all been really quiet as I've gone through a lot of syntax. <laughs> I've been trying to see if I'm getting nods and like okays from people and, and I have, but so does everybody kind of follow the, the, the structure of the program and all of that? Okay. What are the, like, I've seen enum and string and, and those types of things, are those modules that you call methods Yes, those are, those are precisely that. They're just modules that you would call methods on. So if we were to... They're not objects, they're like... Mm -hmm. Well, what there is that they're, they're collections of functions. There's some collection of functions bound up with something called enum. Now, enum is actually not just a module. It's also, it's a property that different modules can use, which is a more complicated metaprogramming thing. If you implement it, it's a certain set of protocol. It's a protocol that other modules can implement. But let's just go with it's a module. It's just a collection of functions. The functions are namespace. They're namespace to enum. So when I try to use them, you know, when I call enum something, it's just telling it where to find this function that I want to call. You find it in the enum module, its name is at, and that's what you would, you know, put together. And because of kind of the, let's open up IEX, let's see if, I don't know if this is going to work, because I don't know if I have the syntax right. Did work. Awesome. <laughs> so this is the uh, a, this is the syntax tree of Elixir kind of being put out here. Um, so um, it, it's everything is going to be broken down into uh, the name of the method that you're calling, the context in which it's occurring which in this case is enum at, as those things are there. It's being called in no context at all, so that's the method name is namespace to enum, its name is at, it has no context, and it's being called with these arguments. Right here, the one, two, and the zero. Okay. Every, everything in Elixir is structured exactly that way. Right, so if I say, quote, do, Gives me a little bit more context since I didn't give it a namespace for the module. It has to tell me what context it's in. It's in the kernel context. The name of the method is plus, right? And the arguments it's being called with are one and two. Okay. And so I have now just told you about 80% of the things that you need to know to metaprogram an Elixir. Because metaprogramming an Elixir is just, oh yeah, just tell it how to construct this tree and uh, by using quote. 
and you're done. <laughs> Seriously. Um, and I'll talk about that really briefly later. Okay. All right, so that was pretty much my, uh, so that was the code. We looked at a few things. We saw the mix tool. We saw that you know, we could start something up with mix new and it gave us an entire project and a good project structure and it imported our test. Uh, you know, we have our test environment already there. It's already written us a test. It's already put in our module. Everything's, it's got a readme file. It's got the EX, you know, it's got the uh, environment files that I need to handle dependencies. All of those things are just built on the new call. Uh, and we saw that, you know, Mix also runs my tests. So like I said, it's kind of like Bundler and Rake uh, and Gem sort of wrapped up into one little thing for you. And we saw a little bit of syntax. We saw the pattern matching. We saw we can just, you can call the same method with a different argument and get a different result. And you can define those arguments as they go. We saw guard clauses where we can say, okay, so this is the function and these are the arguments, and when this argument is greater than or less than this other value, do this thing, right? So how you can kind of break your if and that kind of logic down into your function definition. So we saw that with the guard clauses. You can also do that internally with case statements and, and some other things. Uh, we saw the Elixir kind of relying on recursion and not having while loops, although I couldn't really demonstrate that it doesn't have a while loop, but just trust me on that. Um, and we saw the amazing pipe operator, which once you start using it, is just, it's, it's like crack. You, my entire key utilities, uh, so I write, this, I write this cryptographic key utility thing, and I write it in every language on Earth, right? And in Elixir, I, I, I literally define one variable in 100 lines of code. Everything else is just, oh yeah, just do this thing, and pipe it into the next thing. Because that's all I'm doing. I'm just taking, like, take this hash, pipe it into this, take that other hash, put it into this text converter, and then give me the answer. Um, there's no need for me to define variables. In Ruby, I define a few. In Go, I define a whole lot. Um, I'm not going to talk about Android. Um, so we saw those things. Things we didn't see. We didn't really, I mean, we got a little bit of a look at IEX. You saw there's, a, there's an interpreter. There's a REPL, IEX, which we, you know, we called up and did some stuff with. You saw a little bit about the metaprogramming, but not much. Um, you didn't see some of the cool functions, it's the cool stuff like mix compile, mix depths get, where you say, you know, go, you declare your dependencies in your mix EXS file, and then you say mix depths get, and then it goes and gets them for you and brings them down and compiles them and all those things. Um, and we didn't have a look at the packaging system hex because there'll be a lot. And we didn't look at all of the cool OTP stuff, although it is there. Um, and I uh, didn't call any Erlang functions, but to call them, instead of using a capital letter for the name of the module, you use a lowercase letter for the name of the module and prepend it with a colon. And that is your access to every Erlang module written in the last 20 years. So for a new language, Elixir has a vast set of libraries for solving a large number of problems. Um, and we didn't look at how, how to write packages. Okay, but you're all Rails developers, right? And so what you really want to do with your life apparently is build web applications. <laughs> or at least this is what other people really want you to do with your life. <laughs> so let's build a web application. It's only gonna take a couple of minutes and it's gonna take about mm, four calls on the command line if everything goes well. So bear with me. All right, so I need this. Just copying that. Let's come back over here. Let's get that. Get it over here. Okay. All right. Step one. Eh, probably not. Let's let that roll. Okay. So I was just there trying to install the framework, but apparently I already have it installed, which is not surprising. Okay, so the thing I just typed there, you didn't see it, was mix Phoenix new and a name of an app. Um, and then it's trying to install it, and it wants to know 
you want to install this stuff? And yes, I do. The thing that takes the longest is installing Brunch, um, which is a node dependency that Phoenix has. And the reason it has it is because it live compiles every change that you make to your static assets. So if you change to JavaScript, it live compiles it and pushes the change um, instantly. Um, and the, the server updates immediately, which makes for a very nice development experience. You, know, you change a CSS file, your changes are there. Instantly, you don't have to reload the page or anything like that. Um, it does, however, take some time. It's taking much longer than I thought it would. Oh, and I know why, too. Because I'm not connected to the internet. <laughs> let's pretend we already did all that. And let's see. Do I have anything up there called new app or dev app or a demo app? Come on, you gotta have it somewhere. Are you sure you're not in the directory? Oh, uh, yeah. Nope, I have lost where I put that thing. Ah, uh, no, definitely not. That's a whole other world of stuff. Okay, well, let's just, I've got a Phoenix app up here. That I already built, so let's look at that one. Whew. Let's not. <laughs> let's not look at the tree anyway, at least not at this resolution. Um, so this is a much much more complicated um, mix file, right? Um, this mix file is, is declaring a lot of things, you know, that, that you need to have up. Um, you know, you've got to have, you know, and it's going to have a list of applications, which at the moment uh, in this version of uh, Phoenix doesn't include OTP, but in modern ones does. And this is defining all of the dependencies that it has. So, like, this guy here, Cowboy, is an is a Erlang server. Uh, Postgrex is the thing that connects in, to the Postgres. And then uh, Phoenix is the basic server. Okay. You know what? We might be able to get away with this in this file, which would be cool. So let me try this. Yes, it does. Okay. All right. So you're all used to working with generators. And what this was was a generator, right? If we you know, look at it, saying mix gen, mix Phoenix to generate some HTML. You're going to give me a model. The model's name is other. It's plural is others. It contains a name that's a string, an email that's a string, uh, a bio that's a string, and number of pets, which is an integer. These are the attributes of the model that I want you to create. And it created some stuff for me. You know, so what things are that it created for me? Um, It created a migration. Look at that. That looks really, really familiar. I've seen that before. That migration file. Right? And then it wants me to do something with it. It wants me to add this line 
to my router. Yeah, which, uh, let's find the router. Oh, come on. Oh, it's in web. Look at that. Controllers, models, <coughs> templates, views. Although, just real quick, I really like uh, Elixir's views because they're just modules. They look like everything else. Uh, the templates are the only place where things get a little wonky. So this is going to go into the router. Um, we could spend a lot of time talking about Phoenix, like, because it has many, many cool things. Among them are these concepts of pipelines. If somebody's calling you from the browser, you do one set of things. If somebody's calling you from the API, see what they're doing here is just pattern matching. Right? It's the same thing we saw before. We're going to call this method called pipeline. And if you happen to call it with the symbol browser, I want you to handle this like HTML. If they happen to call it with the symbol a API, right? then I want you to handle it with JSON. So we're just using that same pattern matching idea, but now it's routing everything for us. And somewhere down here under my other resources. Let's put it right there. We do the thing that it told us to do. Fantastic. And then the next thing it wanted me to do was to say, mix ecto migrate. Right. And again, if you're a Rails developer, this is looking really familiar right now, right? You just migrated something, and it told you, oh, yeah, I created these tables for you. This is what they are, and this is where they are. And theoretically, if all of this worked properly, uh, if I do this, oh, come on, what is it? Is it Mix Phoenix Server? Of course it is. Okay. And if I go over here to localhost 4000, and this is kind of the thing where I wanted to take this. If that all worked, which I think it did, then I should have this, right? Which is exactly what you would expect. Right? I've got a nice little view. It tells me, oh, yeah, this is your new view. I can go ahead and create a new one. It's going to give me a form. Right? So very much, and if I fill this out, it'll save it to the database and all of that in the table called users. So um, I got to say, not bad for a year of work um, from the Phoenix team. It's reasonably impressive what they've managed to put together. Um, it probably helps that there are several Rails core committers on the Phoenix team working on Phoenix. It's probably helpful. OK. All right. So symbols are an Elixir thing? Um, with the, the colon and then the thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, those, they're called atoms, but it's exactly the same thing. Okay. Um, the basic data types are. It has basic data types, un unlike Ruby, which only has objects. But it's the uh, symbols and um, symbols, uh, characters, binary lists, which there's a whole other world of stuff on the on binaries, uh, strings, and uh, numbers, integers, and, and floats. So are those uh, symbols in a list? Or are, I, I think they're mutable. So uh, no, no, they're, it's it's kind of the same thing as being like a one-time string. Right as you would expect in Ruby. Right. Everything in Elixir is immutable. Right. Okay, so you, you, yeah, you can't, you can't, you can rebind uh, values to variables, but you can't change a value, mm -hmm. um, which makes things very nice because, for example, if you call, uh, if you send a map in as an argument to a function, you know for a fact that it's not going to change no matter what you do to it in the function. Right? Outside the function, it's going to be the same thing that you threw in there. It's going to be the same struct. Your data doesn't change, no matter what you do inside uh, that function, which is very nice, unless you're explicitly doing some, re some binding outside, which is very nice. It's, it, it eliminates all side effects. And it, it took me a little while to figure out like, why that was cool. And then once I did, it was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this with everything. I'm never calling a mutable method again. 
Um, I, I have because I had to write C. Um, but uh, twelve step programs for that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so okay. So how did I get down here? Let's get. <laughs> Okay, so we built a Phoenix app, and it took, as I said, like what, like three, four commands to get that done? Not bad, right? Um, so Elixir has a lot to offer, and we're gonna go through this really fast. Uh, it's 20 years old, it's rock solid. It's built on the backbone routing technology that runs about 30% of the web and probably 50% of your telephone traffic. Um, you know, I've not seen the phone system go down completely ever, so, <laughs> Hey, not bad, that's, that's good uptime. Um, it's the first functional language I've ever worked with that I was ever really able to work with, where the syntax made sense. It felt good to me as a Rubyist. So if you wanna get into functional programming, you wanna understand it, this is a great place to start, because it's gonna make sense, it's gonna be easy to use. Uh, it's got an amazing community of, of nice people who will answer all your questions on their uh, IRC chat, um, including the people who are working on the tools that you're using. Um, Metaprogramming Elixir is 106 pages long, front to back. Metaprogramming Ruby is, I forget if it's three or 400 and something, but it's thick. Uh, Metaprogramming Elixir is a, a pamphlet. It is much easier to understand the basic structures of how to get the language to have uh, things that you built for it. Distributed applications are a basic assumption of the language. They're a basic assumption of the infrastructure is that you are writing a distributed program, which means there are no callbacks, which means there are no threads, there are no locks, there are no mutexes. You don't have to worry about any of this stuff. OTP does it for you, okay? You don't have to worry about whether you, you don't have to have bundler and rake and install bundler and install rake. Mix does everything. It's got everything you want. Um, if you need the package, package management, it's already written, it's called hex. Uh, it comes installed. You've got a REPL, IEX. There's a pry library that's part of the core of the language if you feel like opening up some pry statements and seeing what's going on with your code, which I do all the time in Ruby. Um, so all these things that you want that are the tools that you're used to, they're there, and some of them are even better than the tools that you're already using. Um, the up arrow goes backwards. <laughs> Phoenix has learned from Rails. It's built by people who are who were Rails users, um, core committers to Phoenix, some of the core committers to Phoenix are also core committers to Rails. So they've learned from all of the 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 mistakes that were made in Rails and they're building a new web framework that is, has much of the stuff that you wanted that they had to learn to build and many of the things that they didn't have to learn not to build. And then some things that don't even have counterparts in Rails like channels, which will enable you to build chat applications out of the box and you know, real-time communication, live updating, and some other fun things. Uh, and here are some resources. Um, and kind of running long, so that is all I have for you guys. Uh, thank you for listening. And, uh, I will be more than happy to take your questions. Oh, right, yeah. We, we have an Atlanta Elixir meetup. Um, which is up at the BitPay offices in Buckhead. Uh, we are meeting next week on this very day, Wednesday. We usually meet on third Tuesday, but I'm thinking about changing it to third Wednesday, so I'm gonna try it uh, next week and see how it works out. Um, we usually have pizza and there's a kegerator in the office. Um, and uh, some, of the, some of the people who are uh, at the meetup, um, we have, there is an Elixir startup in Atlanta and um, their chief engineer comes to our meetup and hangs out. So if you have deep questions about OTP, that is definitely the person to ask uh, more than me, because he works with it all day, every day. Um. I've got a question. So when you run your Elixir code, is it running, sorry. When you run the Elixir code, is it running interpreted on the Erlang VM or does it get compiled into like bytecode that the VM processes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's two um, file endings, there's EX and EXS, and um, everything gets compiled to bytecode, but um, one gets compiled just in time. So they, okay. actually they both get compiled just in time, but one is a script and can be run interpreted and the other one can't. Okay. That's it. And the 
the other question I had was for like the community that's building up around this, are people building third party, I'll call them gyms or whatever, libraries, are they building on top of other Elixir code or are they building on top of existing Erlang code? Or is there kind of a mix of that? It's or? absolutely a mix of that. Okay. So you'll see some things like um, there's a library called HTTP, HTTP Potion, or is it just HTT Potion? I think it's just HTT Potion, which is essentially a wrapper around an Erlang library called Eyebrows with some other things. Okay. Um, to make it, easy, you know, so it's kind of like a, a set of convenience methods and a few extra functionalities on top of Eyebrows. But then there are other Elixir um, packages that you might get that are just completely written in Elixir from the ground up. Um, so there's a variety of different approaches. And is, is that community, it sounds like, I mean, is it pretty vibrant? So It's pretty vibrant. I mean, yeah. people, the people who are building in Elixir are building a lot um, and really enjoying doing it. Um, it's just, there's, it's a smaller community, but it's, it's pretty active. Cool. Thanks. Um, okay. Has anyone else written the looks here in the room? Define written. Smaller. I have a question. So if, if it's a functional language, mm -hmm. how do you manage state when you need state? So if you need state, you've got a couple of different options. You've got Amnesia, um, which is coming with OTP. So you've got your database you can keep things in. Um, Elixir has a specific kind of worker from the OTP uh, system that is built to maintain state. So there's actors and processes, and one of them maintains state, and one of them doesn't. But I'm not sure. One of them is built only to handle state, and one of them is built only to handle behavior. And then you can use kind of a combo worker in the middle with these types of OTP processes. But so there are methods of, of, of handling it in that way. So you've made a case for why Elixir is plausible. When is it preferable? It's preferable, I'm assuming, when you have a very large scale or when you have a lot of concurrency within an action and, uh, and, and like say I'm building an app mm -hmm. at what point do I choose which framework is it is it just a matter of scale I can imagine with a Bitcoin application you're gonna have a huge number of connections so scale would drive you to Elixir um, I really don't look at it as being driven to Elixir okay I mean I'm I'm running to Elixir because mm -hmm. it solves a lot of problems that I want solved and it's really fun to write in. Um, if you happen to, if you're trying to do millions of connections at once, you have to handle a huge amount of concurrency. If you have these problems that are those kinds of specific problems, Elixir is absolutely necessary. You're going to need something like, you're going to need to get onto the Erlang virtual machine if you want to be, if, unless you want to handle you know, a, a lot of problems. If you want these problems to be handled for you, it's necessary. But, you know, as we saw with the Phoenix app, you know, when should I build a Phoenix app? At the same, any time I build a Rails app, because it's essentially the same ease of use. Plus, it gives me some other nice things. I'm going to get faster response times. Uh, like, Phoenix response times are in the microseconds rather than milliseconds. So you're just going to get, for your standard Rails app, it's just going to be a little faster, a little cleaner, handle state better. Um, so I don't think that it's a question of, like, it's not something you would only use if you needed it, because it's a language that's nice enough to where I use it for a lot of things. I write basic shell utilities um, in Elixir. Because um, it's just it's easy to read, it's easy to write, it doesn't have any state, no objects. I'm happy with it. Um. What's the deployment story for? Um, you can app. deploy to a Heroku, and you can, uh, there's a uh, couple of different, uh, like, Heroku-type recipes for that. Um, after that, it's um, pretty straightforward. You just so is it like, get the Erlang VM installed, and then you can compile your yeah. stuff locally, and then it's just dropping binaries? Yeah, it's like sudo app, get, place? sudo app get Erlang, sudo app get Elixir. Well, so would you need Elixir, for example, on your production box? Or do you just need yeah, the Erlang absolutely. VM installed? 
Um, because it's compiling down to bytecode, right? It is compiling down to bytecode, but you probably would um, not necessarily go that route. Um, but yeah, technically you could just run it on Erlang VM if you took the compiled version, sure. I had one quick thing, actually. Right. It's not really a question, but uh, if you're not convinced yet, uh, go on the uh, GitHub uh, repo for Elixir, and like, there's a bunch of issues that you can actually look up and uh, contribute to as a beginner. They even have tags that are like beginner, intermediate, advanced. And the people who write the language actually are like super, super nice, and it'll just help you like get started. It's pretty awesome. Uh, Jose will like even talk to you about stuff, and he's the guy who wrote the whole thing, so highly, highly recommend it. Yeah. Also the author of Crafting Rails Applications, which covers how to build plugins for Rails 4, which is a very good book, actually. I highly recommend. Um, okay. All right. Well, thank you. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.